All right, should, should we get started? Yeah, great. So welcome everyone to this panel discussions on new technologies and platforms in drug discovery and development. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very honored uh, to be here today joining you in this summit. It's been a fantastic couple of days, just all of us coming together to drive forward innovation, build new relationship. I love Jody's intent of meeting at least 50 people. I think that's what she said, 50. I hope uh, all of you are, are, are doing the same and using this opportunity to build new relationships, to drive ideas forwards to fruition. I'm Karine Bustani. I'm the uh, site head for research at Beringer Ingelheim here in Richfield. We're situated about an hour from here. So we like to think of ourselves as part of the greater New Haven area and we're really just thrilled to be part of this buzzing ecosystem that has been blossoming over the past uh, few years here. And I'm joined here today by very distinguished panelists. So we have a very diverse uh, set of uh, people here with very different expertise that we brought forward. So we can have, uh, hopefully, an interesting conversation for you around those new platforms and those new technologies that are truly emerging right now and have potential to be game-changing in drug discovery and, and development. So first, I'm going to start by asking each of the panelists to introduce themselves, and then I'll be pausing a few questions just to get the conversation going, and I'll make sure to leave a few, a few minutes at the end for uh, all of you to, to ask your questions to the panelists. So why don't we start with you, Julian, uh, to, to introduce yourself, and then move on to the rest. Good. Yeah, can you hear me well? OK, that's good. So. Uh, First of all, thanks to Bill Whistler and Yale for the invitation to join this panel. So uh, I uh, really enjoy, as always, the feeling the energy of the Yale uh, innovation ecosystems. It's quite amazing. So a um, couple of words about me and about Catalan. So uh, first of all, Catalan is a purpose-driven service organization. Call us a CDMO. And uh, one of our key mission is to accelerate and uh, bring to scale life science innovation. And we do this by um, bringing a unique set of development, delivery, and manufacturing uh, capability so that every innovator, large or small, uh, can be accompanied uh, on their journey to the clinics and to the market. So we're roughly in number 17,000 employees, 4,000 scientists, and uh, we apply those toolkit of capability across uh, a variety of modalities, small molecule, biologics, and cell and gene therapy. And, and we do it at scale. A couple of examples. So we uh, acquired back in 2019 a large viral vector gene therapy manufacturer. Uh, we invested 1.2 billion there, and we invested on the back of it 3 billion to bring it to scales, and now we're looking to bring the Sarepta DND product to the market. So uh, a couple of words about me. I've been for two decades in the CDMO industry. I'm a nuclear physics engineer, and um, um, we are currently leading a Catalan product development team and a research and development team and, uh, and strategy, uh, ensuring that uh, we lead the 1,400 program that we lead for our partner uh, to the clinic and, and to the market. I'm also ensuring uh, for the company that we position Catalans in space where innovators need us today and, and need us tomorrow. So uh, very proud to be here today because we're, our team are supporting the Connecticut Innovator and uh, we did that as, as an example, helping Vlad Koric and uh, BioVentin to bring uh, new tech quality to the clinic uh, and to the market recently. So pleased to be sharing with you on developing technologies. Thanks. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Absolute pleasure to be here. Um, I think this is... Uh, uh, my first time at Yale, so this is it's quite uh, quite an experience for me. Uh, um, <clears throat> so so I'm Andy Nixon. I'm the global head of biotherapeutics at BI. So I'm one of the, one of Kareen's colleagues at BI. I'm based in in Ridgefield in Connecticut. Um, although my team is spread out across all of the research sites that BI has. Um, so we have a small site in Texas, um, here in the U.S. Uh, in addition to teams in Vienna and and Biberec. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I did, uh, so my, my career started in biotech, so I, I did almost the opposite to what people um, would normally do. Um, and so, so I spent from 1999 to 2016 at a biotech company called Diax, uh, where I was responsible for uh, peptide, protein, and antibody discovery using phage display. And then in 2016, I joined a startup company called Magenta Therapeutics, uh, where I was responsible for 
building out the conditioning program. And, and the idea of Magenta was to make bone marrow transplant a safer, more effective therapy so that we could then uh, use it to reset the immune system. A really uh, interesting idea and, and one that um, I think you know, really has the potential to deliver. Uh, some challenges, of course, with the, the approach. And, and what I did at Magenta was to set up the conditioning program, which was to use antibody drug conjugates to ablate bone marrow, bone marrow cells. <clears throat> and then, you know, going from that, that startup environment, I joined BI in 2017, where I'm responsible for all of the biotherapeutics discovery activities um, to support all of the therapeutic areas, um, you know, from immunology and respiratory to cardiometabolic diseases. Mm -hmm. Um, to oncology um, and, and our cancer immunology efforts. Uh, so a, a really big spread of, of activities. And you know, it's an absolute pleasure to be here and talk uh, more about new, new mod modalities. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Mira Trusha with Westlake Village Biopartners, um, which is located in Westlake Village, California, if the name left some doubt. Uh, that is in the Los Angeles area. Um, the firm um, is a young firm. I've uh, been around since 2018. Uh, very um, you know, strong focus in the life sciences and specifically early stage. So a lot of company building, specifically in the therapeutics area um, in Los Angeles, but broadly throughout the U.S. as well. Um, so in that, in that five years, we've started about 23 companies. Uh, we are managing about 850 million uh, currently. So it's an exciting time. Um, we invest across modalities and across indication sets, so looking forward to, to the discussion today. Um, my background, uh, I'm a scientist by training, so 15 years in academic and industry research in a, in a wide variety of areas. Um, I think that's reflective of the investments I've made over the last um, almost decade in this industry um, across therapeutic uh, areas and modalities. Um, sort of fell into to venture uh, by sort of a happy accident of meeting great people in the Bay Area. I was at a firm called 5AM Ventures, um, which has offices close nearby uh, here in Boston. Um, and, uh, and also in San Francisco, was there for seven years before just recently moving to, to Westlake about 15 months ago to help build out the firm, um, make investments, and, and also help build out the LA ecosystem, which has some features uh, similar to Connecticut in that it's surrounded by some some um, very more well-developed areas, but there's a lot of potential in LA that we are looking to build out as well. So pleasure to be here, and, and thank you for having me. Hi, I'm David Berry. First, thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, brief background, uh, MD-PhD by training, joined Flagship Ventures, now pioneering about 17 odd years ago, uh, helped to build the company Creation Practice, which has now launched about 80 odd companies. About three and a half years ago, I stepped out to launch a company called Valo Health. Uh, and Valo is an AI, if you will, for drug discovery and development company that's building an end-to-end -end solution to fully integrate data and architecture across the entirety of the ecosystem. Uh, we've had a wonderful team that we've been, work we've been working with. We've been supported by investors to the tune of about 550 million and have been privileged to be able to take a number of drug candidates into the clinic and launch a couple of products, which I'm happy to talk to everyone about uh, as we progress in the conversation today. Good morning. I'm Chris McLeod. I'm with a local venture uh, fund called Elm Street Ventures. Uh, we're an early stage uh, investor here in New Haven that focuses on life sciences. Um, our, across our two funds, we've made about 32 investments. I'd say 80% of those are in Connecticut. About 60% of those have licenses or a Yale a founder. And uh, about a quarter of them, we've either helped co-found or been uh, the first term sheet uh, that a company's uh, had as an investor. So. Uh, like to look at the new technologies that are coming out of Yale and, and try to get them commercialized. You know, personally, I've been an operating executive in a couple of industries. I moved into life sciences in 99 when I joined uh, Curigen here in town. I became CEO of 454 Life Sciences, a high throughput sequencing company that was acquired by Roche. So I worked with Roche for a while and did a little backwards, uh, or maybe more traditionally, I guess, in terms of uh, after launching the desktop uh, sequencer there, became uh, an entrepreneur here and started a company to develop antibodies more rapidly. 
Uh, we sold that to uh, Abcam seven years ago, and it was at that point that I became uh, a venture investor here with Elm Street. Thanks, Chris. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Alex Zissin. I'm a partner at a private equity firm called HIG Capital. And um, we have about $55 billion under management. So we do all sorts of things, uh, industries around the world. But healthcare actually happens to be our biggest area. And I help run a dedicated healthcare life sciences fund. And um, I've been there, gosh, I'm in my eighth year. And before that, I did similar investments uh, for 12 years at a firm called Thomas McNerney, um, also based in Stanford. And uh, before that, I was a pharmaceutical and biotech analyst on Wall Street uh, for about 12 years at a um, JP Morgan. But most of that was uh, at a firm called Hambrecht and Quist, which uh, became part of JP Morgan. Great. Thank you very much, all of you, for joining us today. As you can see, you know, we have a a uh, very a lot of uh, expertise first of all on this panel so um and a very broad set of uh, expertise uh, ranging from your know, expertise as cdmos uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, venture funds uh, company creation so and i hope everyone will take advantage of this in, in the discussion um maybe i'll get started with uh, andy since you're my colleague <laughs> Um, you know, you mentioned about your career and uh, you've been in the field of biologics for many, many years now. And I'm sure that you've seen this field evolve quite tremendously over the past uh, few years. Can you share a little bit now about new emerging technologies or modalities within the field of biologics that in your eyes are, have potential to be transformative and have potential to enable us to bring forward these therapies for the patients uh, that we're all hoping to, uh, you know, to achieve? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, it, it has been fun for me to, to kind of be in antibody discovery for such a long time and, and to kind of go from a period where, <clears throat> you know, we were just excited to be able to get a binder uh, <laughs> to, to now to be able to ask much more sophisticated questions. Um, and, you know, when I, when I joined BI, uh, you know, I, I joined really um, to, to, to be able to kind of push antibody discovery kind of further. But, but what, what I've got in, in the last six years is a proliferation and expansion of, of antibody formats, um, different, and, and then also different therapeutic modalities. You know, if I just think about, you know, BI, we've got, you know, vanilla antibodies, we've got bispecific antibodies, multi-specifics, antibody drug conjugates. Uh, we've got um, cancer vaccines, oncolytic viruses, gene, um, you know, viruses for gene therapy. Um, and and all, of, all of that stuff uh, really kind of comes under my umbrella. So it's, in, in, you know, it's much more than antibodies. Yes. Um, <clears throat> but, but, you know, the thing, and, and then, you, you know, and so, so we're now in an in a era where, you know, I feel like gene therapy, particularly for monogenic diseases, is starting to come into its fore, and we're starting to see therapies, and we've certainly got, um, you know, approaches in the clinic for that, which is, for me, that's really exciting. Um, it's hard to ignore the power of AI machine learning um, in, in drug discovery, and so you know I'm hoping that you know we, we can get into a little bit of that. Um, the the thing that that I'm excited about uh, is <clears throat> you know if I, if we stay kind of in in kind of my comfort zone, if you like, it is what we're doing with um, antibodies that were originally identified in oncology. And, and so, you know, in, in the oncology space, yes, we started with, you know, regular antibodies, um, but now we've got things like conditionally activated antibodies mm -hmm. that, that give us the specificity um, that, that we need um, for, for tumor targeting. We've, we've got, um, you know, eight um, T cell engagers, mm -hmm. um, ADCs. And, and the thing that I'm starting to see, you know, and it's really, one of the cool things about being at BI is being surrounded by very creative and innovative scientists is <clears throat> people in non-oncology fields looking at some of those technologies and saying, how can I apply that to my disease area? Um, you know, how, how can I, that conditionally activated um, antibody, <clears throat> I have that problem. You know, how, how can I use that in a non-oncology indication? Or, I, you know, uh, we also have replacement proteins you know, we, we know that, you know, this replacement protein, you know, we could talk about cytokines all day, 
um, is incredibly toxic, how can I you know, manage that toxicity um, and, and have specificity to, to a tumor? You know, can I use some of this masking technology? And so, so seeing how, how those approaches that originally started in other areas are now starting to seed innovation in the non-oncology spaces, or, um, for, for me, is really powerful um, and, and is starting to drive some of the thinking and some, some of the directions that we're going in at, at BI. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, certainly, you know, the tissue targeting or the cell type targeting uh, definitely opens up new avenues for us to overcome some of the safety concerns we've seen uh, with mechanisms. Absolutely. Um, and Mira, uh, in your role, um, you serve on multiple boards, and I'm sure you see a lot of things, and you mentioned you invest in small, large molecules, etc. Can you give your perspective, uh, in your eyes, what's now new and emerging, maybe particularly in the field of small molecules, since we just had a nice overview of the large molecules? Sure, yeah. Um, and I, you know, I looked back at the investments I've done, and while I've invested broadly across the spectrum, a third of the investments I've done have been in small molecules, mm. right? And I think, especially these days, it's very easy to discount the innovation that's happening in small molecules um, and how important they are as a therapeutic modality. Um, if you look just politically, what, what we hear from our later stage brethren is there's going to be less investment in small molecules because of provisions in recently passed legislation, the Inflation Reduction Act, that limits the commercial opportunity specifically for small molecules, right? So not biologics in a mm -hmm. similar way. And if you sort of peel back, why is that? It seems to be that small molecules are associated with non-innovative modalities, that they're the old pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. And I sort of come back to first principles as a scientist and the need to be optimistic as a venture capitalist, which is the fundamentals are 90% of the druggable targets or targets are inside cells. And small molecules are the best modalities to get inside cells. And we understand small molecule development very well. And I think if you look at sort of the three opportunities that are sitting on my desk right now that I'm most interested in, they are small molecules. And they've innovated on small molecule chemistry in very distinct ways. Um, so one, of course, and this is already mentioned, is the power of AI and machine learning. Remember, there's, you know, if you look at the statistics or the numbers, and the numbers are sort of, you know, ballpark, but let's say there's 10 to the 63rd organic stable molecules that are in drug-like space. We clearly have not tapped that potential, and AI and machine learning approaches, when applied appropriately, can really help us start to get at that and get to both best-in-class and first-in-class molecules for druggable targets. And so a ton of innovation there um, that I think is going to become very important. We also see, really, I would say, in the last five years, innovations in chemoproteomics and other ways of really starting with the chemistry and fishing for the targets, right? Mm -hmm. So we're very used to starting with targets and looking for chemistry. And by starting with the chemistry, we're able to really start fishing for targets and start to imagine what's possible if we would re reverse that paradigm. And I think a lot of the early stage efforts which are maturing are, are really interesting there. Um, and then sort of the third is just all of the innovation from medicinal chemists um, new functional groups that are being attached now that we didn't think to attach to small molecules and just building out that arsenal. That's probably the third opportunity that's sitting on my desk. So I think there's, um, and obviously all of you don't need much introduction to Protax, which have been a game-changing modality that's sort of born and raised here, and molecular glues coming along as well. So when I think about sort of two things, where's the innovation that will make a phenomenal difference for, for patients as medicines. I think small molecules are a modality that we will continue to use. And so my perspective sort of as an early stage having to be optimistic person is we will absolutely be continuing to make investments in small molecules and just believe that our job is to look around the corner. And when we demonstrate that these innovative technologies are enabling us to drug things we've not been able to drug before and that they're going to become valuable medicines and prove that out, 
then people will realize that value. We will figure out a way to realize that value. So. Mm-hmm. That, that's a very good point, Mira. And uh, that's something actually that worries me quite a bit when I see a lot more focus on large molecules versus small molecules, uh, particularly for diseases of the central nervous system when you need blood-brain barrier penetration, all the, the mental health, uh, et cetera, that will suffer from a lack of focus on small molecules. So we need innovation there, and there is absolutely the opportunity to do so. And you gave a few very nice examples. I know many people are familiar here with the ProTax, and uh, you know, thank you for mentioning additional ones. And uh, Alex, you're also in a similar role to Mira, and I know you also invest uh, in emerging technologies. I also noticed that you uh, invest in drug delivery systems. Can you share, first of all, with us um, what constitutes for you sort of a winning technology? How do you choose to invest in in, in a technology? And then maybe comment a little bit about the uh, new uh, discoveries in, in, in drug delivery platforms. We, um, when we look at drug delivery systems, we generally don't invest on the system itself as a platform. Um, We generally look at it um, as far as what products can they actually make and then evaluate them as products. Uh, You know, there's no real magic, I I think, in drug drug delivery systems these days. You know, in the old days, it's funny, I was driving around this morning trying to find the Pearson garage, so I was thinking about the early days of um, uh, when I started at Hamburg Quest in 1991, um, drug delivery was a big thing. There were standalone companies like Al's and Alon. And uh, does anyone remember Marion Merrill Dow? Anyone remember those guys in Kansas City? It's part of Santa Fe now. Um, t- t- convenience was a very big um, value proposition. And so they had a deltaism, a calcium channel blocker, that was a three times a day drug, and they came out with a sustained release version that took it to twice a day. And that was a huge product for them. And then they came up with a once a day version and it, it made Marion as a company, it was crazy. And you know, these days you just don't really get paid for, um, for convenience in that mm-hmm. way. You really need a, um, a strong, sometimes safety, but really efficacy proposition because managed care just won't pay for it or they'll make it fifth tier or something like that. So, you know, I, I think, um, so much of the business plans we see where the money is is on oncology. And uh, it's been an interesting ride for drug delivery. Um, you know, in the, gosh, 30 years ago, uh, people were trying different ways to use drug delivery in oncology. And it was either localized, but that doesn't work great right in oncology because usually by the time you really care, the tumors are metastatic. Mm -hmm. So um, there was one of the Blavatnik winners actually had a latanoprost wafer for glaucoma. There was a guy at Hopkins named Henry Brem who developed a um, a carmistine BCNU wafer for uh, glioma. And you could, the surgeon could implant it in the cavity and leave it behind, but it it wasn't a huge difference maker. And uh, people were trying to do intralesional injections with like epinephrine to keep the drug there. But that, that really didn't work well. Um, yeah, there have, been, there have been some things, like uh, non-targeted uh, approaches sort of came next, like circulating liposomes. Mm-hmm. There are a bunch of anthracyclines, and I think Van Christen um, for that. Um, a company developed um, a paclitaxel that had a linker that would latch onto albumin cells called the Braxin, but that was much more sort of to circulate or keep the half-life longer um, and then have it eventually accumulate in tumors. But, you know, the biggest thing in oncology, or really, drug development, I think, for drug delivery, if you think about drug delivery broadly, is um, you know targeting uh, drugs with a payload. Mm-hmm. So there, back to Mira's point, there have been some chances to do that with small molecules. Uh, again, Phil Lau of uh, Purdue had a company called Endocyte using a folate receptor that got sold to Novartis. And we actually were invested in a sister company that instead of a therapeutic payload, has a fluorescent tag. So it, it latches on to lung cancer cells and lights up during surgery to help the surgeon exercise it. So that's kind of an interesting area. But you know, really, antibodies and uh, ADCs uh, have been the big one. I think there's still a lot of room to go there as we better understand cancer biology and mutations and mm-hmm. you know, uh, the right ways to preferentially target. The biggest area, it's not quite bleeding edge, but still cutting edge that we're looking at is um, instead of a, uh, a chemotherapeutic or a toxin payload, uh, attaching a, um, a radionuclide, a particle emitter, okay. 
and um, that, you know, we'll see. There's just been a couple now, but uh, if you can really get it very locally targeted to malignant cells mm -hmm. and have a pearl emitter that really only emits in a very, very narrow range, that really could be the best of both worlds. So there's a lot of startup issues. It's expensive. The manufacturing is tricky. And depending on the half-life, you have to manufacture it kind of very close to where the patient is. But, um, you know, that's an answer. Uh, that's a, probably the hottest area we're looking at in drug delivery for therapeutics right now. That, that's very interesting. And also, thank you for mentioning the patient multiple times yeah. in, in the discussion here, because patient centricity is really essential in the areas of uh, drug delivery, particularly. So I'm, I'm really glad that you take the patient's perspective into account as you're choosing where to uh, invest. So great. So, Chris, now you're, you're uh, a managing partner at Elm Street and you're all, you also invest in life sciences. Can you share your own perspective and, on how you select where to invest right now and what are new technologies that you've been investing in? Sure. So, uh, we tend to look for novelty and it may come in two forms. So, one would be novel biology. And a good example of one of our investments is in a better understanding coming out of Stephen Strip Matters lab of just the uh, biology behind Alzheimer's. And so we're very excited about one of the molecules that we've got uh, in the clinic right now there. But most of what we're looking at would be, uh, I consider, new technology. And I guess a little bit unlike Alex, we go in so early that you know, we're in before you know what the real clinical um, indications are necessarily going to be. So we really do try to understand the technology and how it might be applied more broadly. And there's, if, if you look at our portfolio, there's probably three areas that we focused on recently. Uh, we talked on one, which are uh, the uh, Protax. We were early investors in our Venice, and we're now invested in Craig's other uh, co companies that he started. Uh, Mary mentioned molecular glue, but you know, it, it does, it, it's innovative in the sense it really does blur the lines between what's a small molecule and what's a biologic, uh, because you, it's orally available, and, and my colleague likes to say, you know, it's two pieces of gum on a stick, and you know, what, what you've got on one end is, uh, you know, a molecule that's going to bind to your target protein, and then you've got a molecule on the other end that's going to be what I'll call an effector molecule. So in one case, like the Protax, it's to you know, recruit the uh, proteolysis um, system within a cell. With molecular glue, you're trying to do different things, and that's what one of our investments, Halda, is working on now. So you know, that's one theme of you know, innovation in terms of you know, this nexus between small molecules and, and proteins. Another one that we're really interested in is in delivery. We've got not just ADCs, but again, coming out of a Yale lab, a technology that targets chemotherapy uh, to tumors because of their acidic environment. So using Don Engelman's work in the uh, Warburg effect to try to use that so that you don't necessarily need to have a protein on the tumor that's unique to the tumor, but instead you're, you're going to that tumor environment. We also have a technology that's um, come out of Mark Saltzman's lab at the Yale School of Engineering here, which are bioadhesive nanoparticles. So again, trying to increase the therapeutic index by delivering the, the chemotherapy directly into the tumor and having it stay there. And then probably our, our most of our investments are around a therapy that are, we haven't really touched on that much so far. It's, a little bit of the gene therapy, but it's what we'll call, you know, it's, I'll call cell therapy, mm -hmm. and it's the CAR-Ts that you've heard about. Uh, really revolutionary technology where you're engineering T cells to you know, attack a tumor. The challenge right now is just the expense, the cost of doing it. Uh, we've got investments in early stage technology companies that are trying to address some of those bottlenecks. Uh, two here uh, that are trying to help scientists pick the right clones that they then want to you know, use for the treatment. But a third, which is uh, a technology that tries to address the the constraints that you have in terms of getting the payload into the cell. Uh, it, there's a, a trend that's going on now that's, I, I think we could talk a little bit more about it, uh, Andy, moving potentially away from some of the viral vectors because of the concerns uh, with how they integrate into the genome and, and starting to use CRISPR, which can be a lot more uh, precise, but you know, poses a lot more delivery challenges. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, this technology that we have for transfection allows the delivery, not just allows the delivery of bigger uh, payloads, 
but also uh, is less invasive to the cell, uh, yields a much higher percentage of healthy cells that then can be reinfused. And the premise is that not only can you reduce the manufacturing costs, but most importantly, from the patient perspective, we can reduce the, the, what they call the vein to vein time for how long it takes to engineer the cell and get it back into the patient. Mm -hmm. No, thank you very much. And uh, for also mentioning the CAR Ts, I mean, just yesterday, you know, you talked about them in the context of oncology, but we were having a conversation around them in the context of fibrosis also. So there's potentially other applications as well, uh, very important yep, for the field. And uh, next, Julia, um, you're the CSO of Catalent. Um, and by the way, great uh, CDMO company to work with. Okay. <laughs> I can vouch for them. We collaborate love with them. <laughs> Um, you know, you, your uh, role is to provide solution for some of these challenges, and I'm sure with all of these new modalities come a lot of challenges in, in drug development. Can you share a little bit with us about some of these challenges and how you're sort of working your way to, to enable us to move these forward uh, in the clinic? Absolutely. F thanks a lot uh, for that question. And again, as I mean, the pace of change of innovation of the industry is quite unprecedented. I mean, Andy and, and the other panelists brushed that through, for, or whether from the small molecule angle or new modality. But while those new modality are progressing fast to the clinic, we cover the, the targeted protein degrader and we mm -hmm. brush through that. But also, uh, over, I've, uh, I've crossed the commercial line at a faster pace than we could have dreamed of. Viral vector gene therapy is one of those, and, uh, and also cell therapy. But each of those every new emerging modality has brought a brand new set of CMC or development challenges. When I mean CMC challenges, I mean developability. How do we get those drugs like Protax being orally bioavailable? They bring the whole set of challenges. I mean manufacturability and scalability. How do you bring those therapy to the broadest patient populations? Most of those have been eating uh, rare patients, uh, rare diseases. A small patient population, but as of today, when we think on bringing those to the higher patient population, even DMD is a step above. How do you manufacture those stuff? So, a, a month ago, I, I was sitting at the international conference for advanced manufacturing organized in Boston, and uh, Peter Marx was chairing one of the sessions where we, we discussed those prevalent topics. I can tell you. This is a topic that's really hot with the health authority. When you develop a new therapeutic, you better have to think of the, getting the right manufacturing process from the get-go. Mm -hmm. I, I recall those days in the early 2000s when we were speaking about monoclonal antibody, we say the product is the process. This was a big problem to characterize those. We figured it out. The industry, small discovery people, scientists, biologists have figured it out. Mm -hmm. Now we're in the era of cell therapy and AV, where we're hearing the product is the process. This is not true. And I'm going to quote a couple of examples where I think groundbreaking innovation will and must come. And that's the reason why we form our own technology investment fund with uh, um, a, a large private equity firm in Los Angeles called Leonard Green Partner, so that we invest in the next generation development, delivery, and manufacturing technology that innovator will need from us tomorrow. Viral vector gene therapy, I mean, the way those things are manufactured is very rudimentary, mm -hmm. grossly inefficient, and not cost effective, let's say it's so, right? Uh, you cannot scale it the right way. It's not the way you manufacture um, monoclonal antibody with fed batch bioreactor. Uh -huh. You just use brute force triple transfection because there's a scientific barrier that people have not been figuring out. One of the protein, the red protein, uh, which is one of the protein that uh, generate transcription of AAV, not one of the constitutional protein, is toxic to the cells when it's stably expressed. Guess why? There's going to be a time. It's not a question of if, it's just a question of when this problem will be cracked. And you'll be able to express viral vector on the way you express currently monoclonal antibody. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there is a big need for those. Mm -hmm. Also, the quality of those viral vector is conditioned by these brute force triple transfections. How do you explain that today in ADCOM meetings uh, for the Sarata DMD product? A key point of the discussion was saying, why do I get 40% of empty capsid? <laughs> Guess what? 40% of the stuff you inject to patients that is not directed to the purpose of what you want it to be. And I can tell you there's many, many, many more of those developability and CMC challenges that hinder those therapeutic innovations that brighter people than I are addressing every day to come across many patients. He's so, pointing at you, Andy. Yeah. <laughs>
uh, <laughs> for Asia. And, and the last one, uh, one thing that keeps me up at night is uh, I'm fascinated about cell therapy, but much more looking, we made an investment in IPSC. Uh, to mm -hmm. bring the highest quality banks with the highest genomic integrity, and I know Yale is also uh, spiriting some work in that field. The thing is that when you got this stuff that reached 10 patients, you're going to make a 2D growth, uh, you're going to get a couple of passage, it's going to get good genomic integrity, but the next question is, when you're going to bring it to phase two, phase three setting, faster than you hope, faster than you think, ever for Parkinson, NK cells, or uh, iPSC derived CAR T, then you're gonna to have to grow the cells in bioreactor. And if you grow the cell in bioreactor, like for monoclonal antibody, you induce favorable mutation. And this is already happening on iPSC. Those favorable mutations preserve the growth of the cells and they also maintain the stem cell state. So we see it in labs at a upper scale, we make hundreds of liter batch size, the cell are no longer able to differentiate it. And those mutations that you cannot detect in low, low scale, they will have a maybe safety problem. Mm -hmm. They might be a concern to you. So if you anchor your product that's fully characterized with a process that's not deemed to be scalable, it could be checkmate. So, so we're very committed to investing in those next generation manufacturing platform and technologies uh, to enable that. And I think the industry should be too. So thanks. That's excellent, and I really hope we can crack that nut for uh, uh, the, uh, the viruses. I think this will be truly game-changing for the field. Um, David, um, you, I might say you're a serial innovator. You've uh, founded over 25 companies, I, I saw. Um, when you look back at everything that's happening now in R&D, what do you feel are the major gaps that we have in the field to discover better medicine? What does the world need to become better at, at discovering and developing transformative medicines? How long do I have? <laughs> we only have till 9.50. <laughs> <laughs> and we want to allow for a few questions. No, sorry. <laughs> um, so so this is what you, the question that you asked is exactly what got me into this whole field of data and AI. And, and the essence of this is when you look at, I hate to put it this way, but the history of drug discovery and development, we've had a lot of people using best efforts of the tools and the technologies that we have in the day to try to make a big dent positively in patients' lives. But we have such an inefficient and insufficient way to be able to understand biology and how to make chemical matter that even at this point, we're still just at the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. So I'll give you a couple of examples. When we think about what's going on in, whenever you go to the hospital, when you see a doctor, right? Every doctor has been trained under the modern residency. The modern residency comes from a guy named Wil Wilhelm o uh, Osler. Osler basically codified modern medicine by using 1,800 subjective variables that every doctor learns, takes tests on, and diagnoses you on it. And they're pretty good. They're pretty good. Don't get me wrong. They're pretty good. But if you think about that, and you just said that, you say, well, why, why, do we, why do we believe that to be fact? Just because, well, it's because we do. So one of the things that we've done at Valo, so part of what we do at Valo is we take all the data from all the components of the drug discovery and development ecosystem. We create an integrated substrate, and it allows us to use data across the entirety of the stack. You can think about it as a full stack pharmaceutical R&D capability. So we've now taken, for example, heart failure, which under Osler is called heart failure. Novartis and others have led the effort to make it into multiple diseases, about three. We've used 200,000 quantitative variables to characterize it as 74 diseases. Who cares? Well, some of them turns out to have completely different causes, completely different presentations, and completely different treatments that are needed. Mm -hmm. And what does a doctor do? No disrespect, because they learned what they learned under the era that they did, and they didn't have this information. They treat it all under one umbrella. So now what we have is a better and brighter flashlight that we can shine into different areas where we have current darkness, and we can see what new diseases look like. That's something that we've built. We make it available as a tool. We work with others. We also develop our own drugs on it. Then it comes to making, uh, to, to making molecules. And Mira described this in a very interesting way, right? There's 10 to the 63rd theoretical molecule space. The entirety of the drug industry, in its entirety of its history, has screened less than a trillion molecules. So it hasn't even touched the space. And just to give a sense for it, we're a three and a half year old company. We've built a, now what is a nine day design make test cycle, which compares to about nine months in big pharma, plus or minus, it's three to nine months to be fair. And in that, in that period, two days is computational, seven days is wet lab. Those two days allow us to screen 100 trillion molecules. 
So every week we're screening 100-fold more molecules in the history of pharma. It's kind of cool. Allows us to find all sorts of really, really interesting things. Again, we make that available as a service. We sell it in something called Logica, but it's also an offering that allows us to work with academics because usually at a conference like this, someone will say something about a term called the valley of death, which is a fancy way of saying there's more ideas than there is money, right? And it's true. We don't care because we're not smart enough to judge whose ideas are good or bad, so we make offerings available to academia to say, hey, go make your molecule, go perfect your patents, go figure out if this thing works. And then what we help after that is to help understand how do we predict which of these molecules are gonna be safe and effective, at what dose, which ones are actually gonna be deliverable to what part of the body, because uh, you gotta get the drug to the right place in the body at the right time, at the right dose in order to be able to be impactful. So we can predict all of that quantitatively without ever touching a person. Then you have to design your study, and let me give you a quick example on this. One of our board members uh, used to be Shriya Marathi, then he took some low-level job, I think president of some mediocre Swiss company called Novartis. Um, so we had to let him go for that, it was unfortunate. But one of the things he told us was that when he, in his old job, uh, prior to that, would look at new clinical programs, he'd get an average of 36 streams of information that he had to design a clinical study on. I asked him, how many did you use? And he said, three. He said, which three? He said, I don't know, I picked it each time. <laughs> so when you think about this, and this guy has one of the best drug discovery records in the, hist in the history of the business, right? He's really good at this. What he has is the human version of artificial intelligence, which is otherwise called intelligence. And he uses that to figure out what are the variables that provide the 80-20 rule. But he's given up 33 streams of information. That's just because that's the way the hum that humans work. It's fine, there's no harm. It's like, it is what it is. But computers can take it all into account and design better studies, and that's what we do. So we design studies that are 20% of the size with the same statistical powering. We can find patients who are going to progress in their disease, which means you can see an event. We can figure out inclusion exclusion cr criteria. And again, all of these things, not only do we develop our own drugs, but we make these available to the community because our view is, look, there's not one company that's gonna solve this. This is something where we have to take on the challenge of the future because with 13,000 known diseases where we sit today, not including what we're trying to figure out, and 1,500 that have been approved since the time that the Wright brothers invented flight, mm -hmm. we're nowhere near where we need to be. And I'm giving credit where credit's not due because how many of them went after HMG-CoA? How many of them go after PD-1? We're all important drugs, but we're not 1,500 drugs in. We're not 1,500, sorry, diseases in. We have a lot of progress that we need. And to me, to me the whole question is, how does technology allow us to tip that scale mm -hmm. where we can start moving an order of magnitude, orders of magnitude, and we need, we need tools and technologies that allow us to change fundamentally? Very well said. Thank you, David. I'm sure you have a lot of questions for these panelists. Uh, this was the, the last topic was also very provocative. So. Um, if you'd like, uh, please uh, come forward with your questions. I don't know if we have a microphone. If you want to raise your hand. We okay, we can. Okay, so uh, my name is Frank Lee from Barangar in Goham. So I have a question for all the people, you know, sitting there except Karen and Andy, actually. Because <laughs> he knows what we're going to say. <laughs> yes, exactly. So because of the COVID, right, you know the new modality coming up is about the MRA, right? This is really a new advantage about delivering new modality to treat human patients. And from your perspective, what do you think about that one? Are you guys going to go after this new modality as soon as possible? Or also follow by a question like, how do you think about use AI to facilitate this kind of discovery? Yeah, so, um, yes. Um, so I would say two, two aspects to that. Um, one comes back to the importance of delivery. Um, and so, you know, we've made investments in delivery. Actually, we made lipid nanoparticle investments in 2015. So before anyone cared what a lipid nanoparticle was, right? I mean, half of the innovation has to be around how you target these mRNAs to where you want them to go. And for a vaccine, you can put a very little amount in a person systemically and you will get the response you need to get. The next challenge is how do you get enough mRNA to the target organ um, to really have an effect? Um, and it doesn't need to only be mRNA is the other sort of feature. So we're looking at 
things that are not mRNA. We have investments in circular RNAs that bring differentiating features, and we are extremely interested in targeted lipid nanoparticles and other ways to get them more specifically where they need to go. So I always think about this as, what did we learn from the success and what did we learn about the limitations? So every time we go in the clinic, we learn what something can do and what it can't do. And I think vaccines and mRNA vaccines showed us incredible potential, but when you dissect down to where to from here, we're still limited by technology. And if we look around what's happening in academic centers and by entrepreneurs, people are understanding that and, and innovating there. And so absolutely, you know, though we have investments in circular RNA and lipid nanoparticles, will remain interested in the technologies that take these to the next level and get to broader patient populations and disease states. So uh, in my last life, I, was, uh, I worked at uh, Flagship Pioneering and we uh, founded a small company um, uh, that's been dealing with something that was in the air for the last two years, Moderna. Um, and it speaks to sort of the power of kind of cutting edge innovation done right with the right scale that it can frankly literally transform the world, right? And, and get us to not, get us to be here today, right? So very excited about that. But one of the things that Moderna did incredibly well was they invested in tools and technologies very early on so that when you look at the amount of time it took them from the time that uh, Americans could say Wuhan to the time that the mRNA candidate was made, I mean, it, you could argue it was, depending on what part of the country you want to pick, seconds to minutes to days. Um, now, I think there's a lot of power there. Moderna uses a bunch of tools, technologies, computational power. Uh, I think it's, it's phenomenally powerful. Um, but I take your question in a slightly different way, because mRNA is but one modality, right? Just in the same way that siRNA or RNAi was a modality, what, 10, 20 years prior. I don't want to admit what year it was, because it makes me feel old. <laughs> Um, but where are we going to go from here, right? There's a lot of very powerful insights. So, for example, uh, at Flagship, we founded in, I think it was about 2020, um, a company focused on tRNA. Now, if I go and I talk to a bunch of folks, they'd say, oh, that's crazy. tRNA is fixed, right? We learned about it in grad school. It's done, right? But then you start realizing, wait a second, there aren't 64 tRNAs. There's 2,000 of them. Right? And nature has this phenomenal way of conserving or not tRNAs in various states and disease states. And what we were able to do is use tools like AI and computational power from other sources to start understanding what those rules are and it opens up a whole new drug class. And just to this point, there will be the next one and the next one and the next one, but it's following the biological views and interventions that we've been able to see and the learnings that we have. So I'm excited about, how do I put it, the next one and the one that we haven't yet started the company on. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Yep. Thank you for a great panel discussion. Um, quick one, and for the whole panel, but maybe, honestly, maybe more targeted towards uh, Mira. Really appreciate hearing your comments on the small molecule space and what you guys are seeing at Westlake. Um, curious to get your thoughts on the potential impact of the Inflation Reduction Act, and as you and your partners are assessing small molecule compounds, how that's factoring into decisions. As Julian can attest on the panel at Catalan, we're all seeing sort of a, a small molecule renaissance period of source, which has been great, but of course there's, there's some potential headwinds down the road. So just curious to get your take. Yeah, so I sort of said as, as early stage investors, our role is to be the optimist, and our role is to look not at what's happening today. Our role is to look at what's going to be happening five, 10 years from now. And so our base case is, as this flushes out, and if we continue to develop in this modality and we're developing meaningful medicines that have meaningful change for patients, that the commercial aspects will sort themselves out. And you know, I would say for us, um, I mean, we have the benefit at Westlake of having um, Beth Seidenberg, Sean Harper, folks who've lived in large pharma um, for, for most of the substantive part of their careers. Um, and the feeling, I would say, is, I mean, we're seeing large pharma actively pull out of small molecules, right? Very publicly so. Um, I don't think that is a long-term sort of view. Um, I think they will come back, uh, and I think Sean and Beth would agree, uh, those who have more experience in sort of the large pharma settings, and we want to be there when they come back. We want to be there. It, I believe small molecules may become a sort of scarce resource if people treat it the way the current legislation uh -huh. is, is treating it. 
that is an opportunity. Because if we're going to be able to develop best-in-class medicines in that modality in three to five years, it's going to become very important. Now, does it change what specific opportunities we may go after for a small molecule modality? In some ways, it does. We may not weight the portfolio as heavily um, in small molecules because we are taking account into account some of the broader risk from a financing perspective that we do need our later stage brethren to come on this ride with us as, as we develop. So I think that's one aspect. And I think the second aspect that we take into account is what are the patient population sizes of the programs that we are prioritizing. And so it's not that we won't do programs that have sort of smaller market sizes, but we will be leading those companies with the bigger, broader market opportunities to sort of buffer ourselves against some of the near-term impacts that may be there. So those are the two lenses that I look at it from, that we might edit what we do, but if we fundamentally believe in the medicines we're going to make, then we're going to sort of keep going. Can, can I just chime in from a you know, research perspective? <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, a, lo a lot of people kind of think of me as kind of all biotherapeutics all the time. Um, <clears throat> but, but really, you know, at BI, we're thinking about the patient. You know, what does the patient need? Yeah. And, and, you know, for us, that, that is really at the heart of, of everything that we do. And, and so if we think that the patient's going to be best served by a small molecule, we are going to go after a small molecule. Um, yeah, and so, so that's really how we think about, you know, our, our research drug discovery programs is, you know, what does the patient really need? And, and that's going to dictate the modality that we choose. Great. On this wonderful, optimistic note, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attendance today and your participation in the discussion. Unfortunately, we ran out of time, but I invite you to reach out to uh, the panelists afterwards if you have additional questions. Thank you.